As we saw in an earlier video, only 20% of new divers will enroll in an advanced course. And thus, as many as 80% will not acquire new techniques, and they will not even develop the already learned skills with the help of a professional instructor. That said, how many divers are aware that they have one or more problems to solve? And of those, how many are willing to put in the necessary effort to solve them? Let's now assume that you have some problems to solve. Let's also assume that you are smart enough to realize it and determined enough to want to solve them. Do you have any idea what you have to do? What action do you think you should take? Often, the only real chance we have to improve depends mostly on luck. If we are lucky, we may meet a diver more experienced than we are, who for some reason decides to help us. When the diver who is willing to make an effort to improve, meets someone willing and able to help, even in a short time, much can be done. This happens when either one dives right away with this goal in mind, and then the more experienced diver gives general coverage of the most common problems, using the first dive to observe, and the subsequent dives to further refine. Or it may happen, when while not diving together, the experienced divers already had seen the inexpert one, underwater. To experts' eyes, it only takes a few seconds to do a proper scan, and figure out where to start, to get those initial results. That will pave the way, for what will be done next. The expert can do an extremely focused briefing, even before the first dive. Made it simple, they save one dive, and when we have short time, and few dives available, that is no small gain. The instructor, the guide, or just the experienced diver, becomes a bit like an entire curling team. They throw the stone in the right direction, and then they keep the path as clean as possible, clearing every obstacle, to get the stone exactly where they had planned. They have already clear in their minds, the path the diver must follow, including the middle steps. By eliminating some of the tasks that would fall on the struggling diver, allows the diver himself to worry only about those things that are the subject of practice. If the diver is going off the track, designed for him, the expert one alerts him immediately so that he can think about it, making out in time the necessary adjustments. The expert is primarily concerned with building a psychological feeling as quiet as possible so that the diver in trouble can concentrate on techniques more freely. And more or less, the same concept can be applied to the courses we take. But is this a real improvement? Often it's not. Why is it not a real improvement? Because there is no reasonable guarantee that this diver can repeat the same good performance outside the quiet conditions created specifically for him. And to be even more specific, there is no guarantee that this diver could repeat the stressful good performance in any reasonable dive situation he might encounter. And perhaps, this is what has already happened to some of us. We have well performed during the quiet and reassuring atmosphere of the course, only to find ourselves somehow struggling outside the course itself. How do we get improvement? To get an improvement requires knowing how that specific skill we want to improve should be performed, and repeating it a sufficient number of times until we have mastered it. Logical and simple as it is. The various types of problems and mistakes are often interconnected, but the most difficult to solve are always those related to stress and fear. How do we achieve improvements when stress and fear are the problems? In this case, we can use an ADAPT, a technique used by athletes practicing gymnastics or body weight workout, but certainly in use in many other contexts. The performances that these athletes learn to do are among the most difficult from a technical point of view and the most exhausting from a physical point of view, and they require a progression that can lead to a level of performance precluded to the vast majority of us. For example, suppose we want to perform our first pistol squat, which is a single leg squat. For coordination, balance, and strength, what may seem like an easy exercise is often impossible to perform on the first go, even for athletes already trained in other disciplines. What we need to do to do our first pistol squat, is to identify what the propedeutic exercises are. 
Those exercises are somewhat simpler, but develop a quality that is transferable to the final exercise we want to do. For example, this picture shows an athlete performing a pistol squat. On the other hand, this second pic shows another athlete, probably not yet able to perform it, performing a perpetuitic exercise, taking advantage of an aid that makes the exercise achievable. In this way, he can develop the strength and balance that will lead him to perform the next perpetuitic exercise, and so on until he can perform the full exercise without any external aid. To use this approach to our advantage, it is necessary to know what the propedeutic exercises are, for that specific exercise that we want to improve. But the real secret, is to decide which is the propedeutic exercise from which to start our progression. Because our ego, our status game, might push us to start from a step that is too advanced for us, compromising the whole process. Let's translate this into something useful for divers. The propedeutic exercise we choose should cause a level of stress that allows us to practice the necessary technique. By practicing the necessary technique, we should build the technical and psychological base. And when we master this level, we are ready to move to the next step. For example, if we tend to perform the recovery regulator too quickly, the risk is that we may forget a crucial step. The reason why we act so fast could be that we are afraid of running out of gas before we are ready to breathe in from the recovered regulator. In this case, we could work on two sides. Extend the time we can remain without breathing in, and on the other hand, decrease the time we need to recover the regulator, respecting of course the right technique. Both options should be explored, and the second one can be safely practiced by continuing to breathe from one regulator, eliminating the fear of running out of gas, and recovering the other. We can repeat this exercise several times in a row, while keeping the stress level at a level that allow us to focus on the technique. When we have made the recovery technique our own, we will be ready for the next step. And to be even more practical, we could include this and everything else we would need to improve in a simple procedure consisting of a few easy steps. And again, this procedure would be nothing new because it is already widely used in many other areas, some far more complicated than recreational diving. But then, if everything is so simple and logical, what prevents our improvement? There are at least a couple of factors that prevent our improvement. The first is time, understood as both the little amount of time we can spend underwater and the huge amount of time that can elapse between our dives. Sometimes days, more easily weeks, but often months. We have little time to learn, and plenty of time to forget what we had learned. Like on a seesaw, technique and confidence gained, rise, and then fall down again. What is the trick to overcoming the limitations of time spent in the water? The trick is to use the time spent out of the water to prepare for the time we will spend diving. Also this is a technique used successfully in many other fields, and an extremely powerful technique that can positively change the course of an entire diving career. This prodigious technique, as much as anything else, can be impeded by the second factor that can prevent all our improvement. By far, the most difficult problem to solve, and one that has blocked a large number of divers. We are talking about laziness. Dozens, if not hundreds of studies conducted over the years, have certified this truth. We are a lazy species that struggles to commit beyond a certain limit, and like water, our element, whenever possible we tend to choose the easy path, even if it's not the best one. And again, there are no tricks. The only way to overcome laziness is motivation. Those who are motivated do. And those who are not motivated enough get stuck. But why is it so necessary to improve ourselves? After all, there are people who after years and years, continue skiing or swimming as a beginner does, and don't bother to improve. Couldn't we continue like this? The problem is that diving is not like all other activities. Indeed, among the various activities we can do, there are very few that confront us with so many obstacles. 
just has, there are very few, that can reward us like diving. The risk of not improving, is that by remaining slaves of stress and technical limitations, we may never get to enjoy it, to the fullest. Or we could even stop diving. Not by our free choice, but forced by our limitations. And of course, bad skiing techniques, as well as bad swimming and diving ones, can affect even our safety. Thank you for watching this video, and take a look at its description for the link to the next episode of this series.